have set up the Stern report. So uh, please go ahead. Well, Tony, I suppose the thing that I just want to make clear is what are we really debating here? And what we're debating as a result of Martin Durkin's film is the basic science of observed global warming. Now, terms like observed global warming are used interchangeably with regard to global warming generally and also with regard to climate change. Now, the science of observed global warming, notwithstanding the fact we're having quite a robust debate here, if you look at the great bulk of the world's climate scientists, around 98% of them really accept that basic science. That is as close to certain almost as you can get in relation to science. Yet there are uncertainties. And those uncertainties are essentially about the future. And future prediction is always going to be uncertain. And that's why when you look at the IPCC reports, you have scenarios. You have lower scenarios, middle scenarios, and upper scenarios. And for mine, I very much hope that, you know, they're wrong. I very much hope we don't have a problem. But I think when you look at the balance of evidence, we do. So when you look at those scenarios and you look at where we are travelling in relation to that warming, what it actually gets very scary is not actually with the warming effect. It's what the severe climate effects are going to be of that warming. And that's when, when we had briefings from major scientists and others at 10 Downing Street that's when it gets very frightening, because that's when scientists actually become ashen-faced and say, well, I can't really say what is going to happen with that amount of carbon in the atmosphere, that amount of warming, and therefore what's going to happen in terms of severe weather. And that's when this issue is not actually about science, it's about security. It's about economic security, it's about our physical security in relation to the human population movements that may well occur if the future predictions prove even half right. Nick Rowley, while you're talking, I, I'd, I'd want to ask you how seriously uh, this film was taken in the UK and did it actually change the debate there and did it influence policy? Well, I'm still in touch with a fair few people who do work in climate change globally and certainly in the UK as well. I mean, the term was used, you are telling lies, very early on in the programme and Robin did a very good job of saying, well, who are those liars when you're talking about the scientific community? Well, those lies, I think, when Martin put those, those words in the uh, documentary, I don't think he was only referring to scientific lies. I think he was also talking about people in the media. He was talking about senior politicians. He was possibly talking about some people who he might have had front of mind. They include not, uh, you know, how can one say, liberal-minded uh, environmentalists who think we should all go and live in yurts and eat organic food. <laughs> He's talking about people like... Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's talking about business leaders like Rupert Murdoch. He's talking about uh, people like Chancellor Merkel uh, in, in Germany. Tony Blair, yes, and he's been mentioned by Bob Carter, uh, David Attenborough. Now, David Attenborough is someone who has taken a while to really get involved in this debate, but he's put together an absolutely fantastic documentary, which is looking at the level of risk that the world is placed under by this problem, and problem it is, and big problem it is. So he is really, in that program, Martin Durkin is not just talking about scientists, he's talking about a lot of people who he is calling liars. Let me bring in another of our uh, panellists now, uh, Dr uh, Nikki Williams, is the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, New South Wales Minerals Council, Director of the Australian Coal Association. Now, those titles alone might once have suggested that you'd be a sceptic. Certainly not. I mean, the, uh, the industry for at least a decade uh, in Australia has acknowledged the uh, reality of global warming, the contribution of man-made CO2 and, uh, and other greenhouse gases, and importantly, um, recognises that the potential uh, risks associated with climate change uh, are such that action is required. We have to take action and we, we as a, a producing industry have a very important role there. And I think there are some very important points that you raised. Essentially it's not the science, it's actually the policy responses to the magnitude of the risk. And I guess that's where the key debate needs to move now. We need to make sure that our responses, because they will have major social, economic and political impacts, are proportionate to the magnitude of the risk. So actually defining that risk and increasing the robustness of the science, refining our understanding of the models and all of those sorts of things are important if we're going to deliver uh, results which are not only appropriate in the developed world, but most importantly for the developing world. Ray Evans, um, as I said, you worked in this area in the past advising Hugh Morgan. I mean, does it feel strange to you to hear uh, 
a new generation of people working in the fossil fuel industry who think completely differently to you? <coughs> no, my experience in, <coughs> in industry over 20 years uh, was that <coughs> many companies can't wait to roll down or lie down and get rolled over because they're frightened to contest the issues. And certainly the response of many coal companies has been both predictable and pathetic. Uh, but uh, the, thing that, uh, <clears throat> the thing that impresses me in terms of the way in which the Greens have taken out firstly Shell, and BP uh, <clears throat> and other oil companies, and of course Enron, don't forget Enron was one of the great supporters of uh, global warming, uh, <clears throat> was that they forgot to worry about the beer industry because it was the beer industry which funded Henrik Svensmark's experiments on cosmic rays, because all other sources of support had been denied him. And the thing that I find extraordinary about this debate is the sheer bloody-mindedness, the desperation that is now manifest on the part of the, uh, the anthropogenists, as I call them, who are convinced, despite all the evidence, that anthropogenic carbon dioxide is the main driver of climate, uh, as opposed to those people who find that the evidence is not there, has not been there, and who object mightily to the fact that the IPCC will commit fraud in order to try and persuade people that its claims about CO2 and temperature are right. Could and I the, say actually... No, no, hang on, let me finish. Man's <laughs> hockey stick yeah. was a fraud. It, it was okay. a fraud, and if it had been... <laughs> If it had been put forward by a private company seeking support to float the stock exchange, those people would now be in jail. That's nonsense. That's the, Ameri the, Ameri true. the American Academy looked at that over two years ago very thoroughly and published a paper in the journal Science showing that the hockey stick stood up. But could I say, the one exciting thing that's happened in, in Australia in the last year or so is that industry, not least the round table, uh, of, of a number of companies like Westpac, AIG, Swiss Re and so on, have come together, and they're very sceptical people with lots of experience. And Fiona Wayne, who's in the audience representing uh, business and in environment, a whole number of people are doing those wonderfully effective things, facing up as you have, to what is a clear and apparent problem. I think, I think it's an important point. I mean, if you, if you look at the coal producers, the coal producers this year have committed $1 billion uh, to the deployment of low emission technologies. Now, companies are rational entities and they are, uh, in this instance, uh, recognising the seriousness of the problem and saying, we are going to be involved in the development of the solutions that not only Australia, but but the rest of the world needs. And they don't do that because they're pathetic. They do that because they understand their, their, their uh, responsibilities to the world and because it's, uh, it's the right business decision to and take. Done okay. And because there's a buck yes. to be made, there's now an entire industry. This is a book I just got from America, the Financial Review today. There's a lot of money to be made by industries that hop on board the carbon train. That's, that's, that's another fine. reason they're doing it. Making okay, money. Okay. I, I just wanna, I'm going to interrupt because there's at least one of our panel. At least one of our panel we haven't heard from yet. Now, I'm sure uh, Greg Bourne, the sceptics, would regard you as a turncoat. Uh, former <laughs> no, no, no. chief executive of BP Australia. <laughs> Certainly not, apparently. To uh, CEO of the uh, World Wildlife Fund. Now, were you surprised uh, to find that some of the key sceptics uh, within the global warming swindle, the great global warming swindle, were actually people who have long-standing connections uh, with big oil and even with big tobacco? I, I guess the way I'd look at this, Tony, is that... Um, you know, I've got 35 years as a chemist, engineer and businessman. In 1992, uh, 1995, BP said, let's leave behind the Ray Evanses, let's leave behind the Bob Carters, let's leave behind these sceptics. There's enough science background knowledge inside those companies to critically analyse what was going on. Sure, there's uncertainty, but the way business goes is thinks about risk and it works out what are the probabilities and should, should we move. In 1997, a company like BP moved and recognised, just like Nikki said, climate change is a real issue. It's a real issue for mankind. We need to deal with it very, very quickly. Uh, we have the ability, the ability to tap into the best of peer-reviewed scientists such as David Caroli and interrogate him and interrogate his scepticism. But in the end, it's about the management of risk. And business these days has moved on. There is not, I think, a serious board member, CEO in Australia, and really in the world these days, 